All right, hi everybody, it's Joey Remini here from Seeking Balance Australia. And I'm really excited to be talking with Celia Bolton today. So hi Celia and welcome. Thanks so much, Joey. This is gonna be fun. <laughs> yeah, so Celia is a really a beautiful friend of mine, but also she has been a mentor for me in healthcare. And Celia is a specialist in men's and women's health, pelvic health. She's a physiotherapist, a senior physiotherapist with a clinic down near the surf coast where we both live. And her clinic is innerstrength.com.au for those of you who want to chase up Celia after this conversation. But today we're actually here not to talk about pelvic health, although we could, but to talk about the concept of living on purpose. And the reason I invited Seals in for this call is because I've really admired watching how Celia makes very conscious decisions throughout her daily life and her weekly choices and with in particular regard to caring for the environment. And so I thought this was a really hands-on kind of simple human story that represents what it means when we step into living with purpose. And for those of us who are undergoing any type of healing or recovery process, we are often stopping to ask ourselves, you know, what makes me happy? Where does my deep meaning lie? Where are my values? And what is my purpose? Has it changed in the last 10 years? And these questions, are, they're big questions, they're beautiful questions, and sometimes it takes us time to nut it out. So, Seals, I wanted to kind of open up this conversation with you. And why don't we start from the beginning? When did you kind of realise that this caring for the environment and living within the environment in a way that works for you that sort of consolidated and became something you were more committed to and you know what that looked like in terms of bringing conscious awareness okay I think my first sort of awakening there was at university mm -hmm. and so I've carried that with me um with that purpose with me so I've always been a little bit aware of um environmental issues I've got a few very close um girlfriends we call ourselves the seven sisters and one of them is an activist and so whenever she just drops into my life which is fairly infrequent I get this dose of whoa this is what's actually really quite important to me I agree with what you're doing but um, when did it start to become more powerfully um, part of my purpose was um, two things one having um, a daughter yeah. and um, you know there's always this noise about what what um what we need to do to care for the environment wherever i am but then uh getting some breast cancer and recovering from that and then taking stock going mm -hmm. <sighs> what's important to me yep. i've got a new lease on life now i'm happy to be here what's important and that became the loud noise it became the thing that wouldn't go away and and, it, and to me, you always carry more than one purpose in your life. And this one just became louder. And so it, and it's just got louder and louder. And so for people who might not really understand what we're talking about, do you want to talk through the practical day-to-day -day aspects yes. of what caring for the environment means for you? And I just want to start this off by saying we're not ranting here about shoulds in the right way or whatever. This mm. just happens to be Celia's personal perspective. And I really have, I actually met Celia, I think on the day you were diagnosed with breast cancer. So I met you in this eruption of, wow, big changes in my life. So I've kind of seen you go through that part of that process firsthand. So just from your perspective, yeah, what did that look like caring for the environment? What did it mean? Um, this, the thing that comes to mind is the personal's political so it mm -hmm. is like I, I'm active on many levels but the bit that seems to be the most important is just I need a new pair of shoes um, do I um, really need a new pair of shoes um, okay if I need shoes perhaps I could go to that op shop first and it's just sourcing from the least the most friendly earth decisions and it's just one little thing at a time and so keeping in mind when I'm just shopping, uh, just looking at how things are wrapped and um, just finding the path that's the least um, affecting the environment. And then it just feels comfortable. It just feels comfortable that that's the purchase that I've done today and that's the best I can do. And it's not always great. 
So mm. every, every little decision makes a bit of a, quite an impact. Yeah, and I another one of um, my people who I really admire, kind of a role model for me, Catherine Devaney, she taught me, you know, put your money where your vote is. Like whatever you buy, you're telling the world that's what you support. Yes. And so I've been really conscious of, you know, trying not to flippantly use plastic or, you know, the one-time use cups or plates or forks or spoons. Uh, water, bottles, water bottles is a big one, but, you know, I suppose it just starts with that intention of bringing awareness and trying to think forwards too because, you know, you can always have a set in the car or something, but it's tricky. It's really tricky. Mm. And so one of my questions for you was coming back to health and integrative medicine and well-being. Do you notice in your personal life, if you begin to make choices that are not consistent with your love of the environment and that purpose you have to not contribute to landfill and, you know, be the person who is the political. So if you start to maybe use lots of plastic or go and make some of those decisions that are not consistent with your values, do you notice any impact on your health? How does that make you feel? Uh, it's direct. It really is a direct impact. So... Mm. Um, it generally, if I'm on my purpose, I am generally, I have enough time to make these decisions. I'm not, I'm not rushing. So it's a slow down lifestyle mm -hmm. and that has a direct impact on my life in that, um, I will be more likely to be getting my sleep. Yeah. Two things go together that if you're living on purpose, if I'm living on my purpose, I've got time to uh, shop at the right places. I've got time to um, make food rather than buy it ready made. So mm -hmm. it's that it's slow down. It's a slow down movement, and that's great. It's great for my health. Yeah, and there's no. I mean, it it's, can sound a little. I don't know. It's the, it's that whole thing of when our health smashes us in the face, and we're like, oh my god, I'm not immortal. <laughs> yeah. I'm not invincible. And that's that real awakening. Yes. It can be quite a powerful time and quite a transformative nudge yes. for all of us to say, okay, what decisions am I making that are actually insidiously? So it's this invisible process of cringing at yourself. Cause it's like, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I make that decision? And we can end up going home and not sleeping as well because mm. our actions and our behaviours are not consistent with our actual heart and our yeah. underlying purpose. And I think that conversation is not, not that often out there. And for people who are new to this kind of conversation, I thought it might be good to, you know, flesh it out a little bit. So you spoke about your daughter. Mm -hmm. And what does it mean? What what does it mean for you in terms of I'm imagining reading between the lines this idea of what planet am I leaving her? Yes. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And so, do you want to speak a little a, a little bit on that? Um, look, I, I actually think children these days are bombarded with um, sustainability, uh, well intentioned sustainability uh, teachings. And I think it's actually causing a little bit of unnecessary stress for them. And I think we need to manage that carefully. So I actually think I'm not going to hide um, truth from her. So what I have to do is live by example. So if, I, if it's really important that um, if she's being told that the environment, um, you know, the plastics in the ocean or um, climate change, if that's a really important thing and she's being taught that, then she needs, for me, I want her to see that if it's important that we're acting consistently with that message. So it actually isn't necessarily about the environment. It's about being consistent with the information that's coming to, into the family and yep. that we are, we are um, uh, I guess, behaving powerfully and a little bit more in control of the um, message for her. Yeah. Gosh, that's so beautiful because I read an article recently which was not on children but adults and this idea of demoralisation mm -hmm. and that we're losing our foothold of where we fit in community and where we belong. And if you feel powerless to systems, you know, and the boss and the, the rules that are governed by governments or communities that you don't necessarily align with or agree with, it can feel really disempowering. Mm. 
And there's this hopeless, helpless kind of dilemma that can kick in. And I actually did see another article which was specifically on kids and saying how they're being told that the world's going to end, the environment's ruined. And so they're at school feeling that they're living in a broken world and they don't know what to do about it. And it's a, it's a really big deal for a child to deal with. That's a big adult conversation and big adult emotions, you know. So I think um, I didn't, yeah, that, that's a really nice thing that you're, letting your daughter have actions to take so she's a part of the solution and then empowered in that way for her as she's learning. Which, which to me is not only about the environment, it's actually about any message that she chooses to be, to, to um, be passionate about, that she's going to be part. She's going to, she's going to choose actions that make her feel powerful. Yeah. And actually, I mean, in the therapies I do with people, it's the taking action bit that can be the life-saving aspect. You know, you can talk about these things and you can, you know, think them through and, and have all of this internal process, but to actually understand what's going on and act on it, I think is really when the neurons start to rebuild and shift and change. It's the taking action part that I think sometimes is the missing piece in the puzzle. Yeah, and I so would love to talk about that. Mm. Um, because I, I really think that's because um, in in the work that I do yeah. with people that have chronic pelvic pain, that's the missing link. That's often um, you know that people have to actually come to their own realization eventually yeah. that um, it's about taking power back yeah. and being their own um, being their own solution. Yeah, which gives me goosebumps. I'm actually writing a book at the moment on healing vertigo. Ah. And in many ways, I, you know, you work with the lower body and I work with up here, but a lot of the processes I think do overlap in ways. Oh, absolutely. But my, my first chapter is really about inviting people to become the senior investigator, become the expert in the process. Yes. So rather than going to experts, specialists, doctors, neurologists, whatever, and saying, hey, can you fix me? Hey, can you get rid of this? What we're doing is we're saying, okay, you're expert in a piece of a puzzle. I'm going to need that data. So I'm going to employ you as my investigation assistant. And we're going to use that and then I'll decide what to do with it. So it's this idea of stepping into the leading team member and becoming the expert in your own recovery process, knowing that no one else can deeply understand what's happening in your inner world and no one else can know your purpose. Like if Celia, if you didn't tell me you were passionate about the environment, I wouldn't know that, you know? Mm. So it's our job to inform the world what we're about and what we're feeling and what's important to us and how we want to move forwards. And then, of course, using expertise in ways that works. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, the, the one going forward from that, the one thing I did notice when my physio life and my environmental life Mm -hmm. What happened is they, they have, for me, I think um, they're both really important. But what happened when I started to go baby steps to meeting other people that shared a similar concern and were willing to become active in that, it's like I jumped into a tribe. Mm -hmm. I actually jumped into, I just went, this is actually much easier than I thought mm -hmm. because um, the people I usually meet you know, through different um, circles of life are fantastic in that they uh, have, we share something. But when I found people that shared the same passion in the same area, it was like, oh, this is a special place for me. I'm meeting people that I am instantly friends with because we share massively um, big part of our, of who we are is shared. And it's actually, it felt like a, there were barriers to, to acting like that because, you know, I'm not an activist or I'm not this, I'm not that. Mm. Um, but actually once I did a baby step in, I went, oh, this is actually quite comfortable. And, and so those little baby steps, what I went is, wow, this is actually, I feel very safe in this environment. Yeah. And then actually that, and I, I think of that term congruence where if the inner and outer world are matching, yeah. It actually becomes comfortable in your body, but your magic things happen. You just meet people yeah. that are, you know, let's go together and let's do this. 
Yeah. So words that are coming up for me in that is it's easeful. Yes. And there's an element of effortless effort. So it's not that you do nothing. There is a that mm. baby step and that effort, but it somehow feels effortless. There's a flow. Yes. And I think for me, it's my music, you know. Yes. I mean, there, there's circles of friends where I'm a bit embarrassed to bring out my fiddle and play my violin or whatever. And I don't want to talk about it. And I, I feel that, you know, it's not their scene. And then there's other times where it's just like you're a fish in water and it's instant friendships and it's, you know, hours of music making. And, um, and that's where we, we step into community and we feel a sense of belonging. And mm. there's a couple of basic fears that all humans have. And one of them is fear of being shamed. And that comes from our tribal existence when it was really important for our survival that we acted as a pack. And so part of protecting that tribal um, you know, regulating a system so it worked was actually having shame. So if you did something that went against tribal philosophy, you were out in the desert, you, had, you know, you were no longer a part of the tribe and then there was this huge shame emotion. So, yeah, a lot of humans are longing for belonging and longing for acceptance and approval and to be liked and to be loved. And it's actually a process to make that happen, to deeply feel it and to have, like you said, that baby step that's like, ooh, Oh, I wish I'd been doing this for years ago. You know, it's that feeling of being at home and being at ease. So I wanted to finish with, if you don't mind, Seals, maybe um, talking a little bit about any little actions people could take in terms of exploring purpose or their connection to the environment. Because in my mind, we are part of Mother Nature. We are part of her. Mm -hmm. So caring for ourselves and self-care is part of caring for Mother Earth. It's all interconnected. Um, but any, any little pieces of wisdom you might have that you've learned over the years, any questions you asked yourself when you had your daughter or when you went through breast cancer, things that helped you make those baby steps? Um, what's coming to mind is a little tiny bit off topic, but... Um, I've, I've learned a lot about neuroscience and the, the thing that I notice that helps when I'm feeling bad or if I'm confused or um, those moments where you're just not on topic on purpose a mm -hmm. little bit um, the term I sometimes think of is then we or you know there's a, another term that I sometimes think about but it's about going okay I'm cold I'll put on a jump yeah <laughs> <laughs> and just start with something small oh my oh my shoe's uncomfortable I didn't notice that I'll take it off and it's just sort of starting in you know something's not quite right start very close and and then then decisions become a bit easier because there's something more comfortable happening in in your body and it's always worked like I, if, if ever I felt really crap I might go, oh, what can I do? And um, I often talk about first aid to clients. You know, mm -hmm. what, what do you do when you're feeling like that? But mine has always been just start with have a bath or, you know, start with something very, very small mm -hmm. to build, bring myself back into I'm a bit more comfortable in my body and then I can think clearly. Yeah. And so for many of my clients, it will be the body scan. Yeah, so they'll be grounding, checking that their compass has got north and south, you know, really checking in that they're safe and they know what's where and they can feel their legs and their feet. Um, but, you know, it also is that thing of um, like acting locally, then globally. It's like start yeah. with your own body. Yes. Make sure you're hydrated, well slept. You've had yeah. a meal, get a cuddle if you need it. Ask someone to cook for you if you need that. Yeah. Get a babysitter if you need a night off the kids. Like, get your own internal world addressed and mm. met. Yeah. And see yourself where you are rather than where you feel you maybe should be, which is a, it's an inner judgment. Mm. And, and, yeah, start with those simple but powerful um, little feelings and powerful actions. Yeah. And then, then what happens is then the purpose is possible. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like we're, we're teaching ourselves that the can do. We're reminding ourselves that there's something we can do. Yes. Instead of reinvesting our energy in that, well, I'm helpless and hopeless and there's nothing I can do. It's like, no, yeah. I can put a jumper on. I'm cold and I have a jumper and I can yeah. put that on. Yeah. And it's like there's a switch in your brain. Your brain goes, okay, this is okay. 
there actually is. Mm. And when we're stressed and in fight, flight, freeze, the left and right side of our brains aren't able to communicate over the corpus callosum as well. Yeah. You know, it all jams up and it kind of goes into that emergency mode. And then when we relax and we gain safety, all of those networks are able to then move freely throughout both hemispheres and go back into flow state. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a bit of a switch. Yeah. And, um, you know, to me, that's, that's sort of, that would be my key to living with purpose because it's hard to live with anything <laughs> while you're in fight flight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking maybe if there's anyone who's like ears pricked and you want to take a couple of steps forwards for yourself, maybe even there's a, there's a beautiful Buddhist practice. I believe it's Buddhist. I'm not Buddhist, so not sure, but I think it is. And they pretend, the monks pretend there's a bird on their shoulder and the bird is like whispering in their ear or screeching in their ear, you're going to die tomorrow. You're going to die tomorrow. You're going to die tomorrow. It's just constant. And so what the practice is, is saying, if today were your last, last day on earth, what would you really say? What would you really do? You know, which priorities would skyrocket to the top and which would fall down the bottom? So that can be a really um, kind of powerful entry into making some of those decisions and reprioritizing what's most important. And there's actually a bunch of other exercises, I believe, in module four or five of Rocksteady, where we go into this conversation a little bit and looking at inner wisdoms and values a bit more. So it feels so, it's all, I mean, it's always great to talk about these conversations because they're so important. So thank you so much for showing up. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That was fun. Yeah, well, you're always welcome. And you've been a huge part of the Seeking Balance community since the day of its birth, really. So yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, and I really love what you're doing, Joey. Keep it up. Yeah, and look, if anyone's out there and you do have pelvic health questions, Celia is a wonderful person to have in your in your directory, and she's got lots of tools to add to your toolbox. So it's innerstrength.com.au. You can reach out, and Celia will be happy to offer you any advice and wisdom she has in that realm of pelvic health care. So all the best, everyone. Stay on purpose. And sometimes you've got to lose your purpose in order to find it. So that's okay too. So on that note, thank you, Celia. And bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>